<laughs> Coming up on this episode, we're diving into the greatest heists in history. That's right, bank robberies. We're going to find out the best way to get some big cash out of your local vault. Stick around. It starts right now. This is Up for Debate, episode number 138, recorded February 28th, 2019, Safe Crackers. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Up for Debate, the debate podcast where the two hosts agree on everything. I am Sean Jennings, joined as always by a man who is definitely going to get me in trouble when someone looks at my Google search history. It is Mr. Matt Mariani. <laughs> Hello, Matt. Hear that? It's the FBI at your door, Sean. Uh, Sean, why were you searching how to commit bank robbery? <laughs> it's for the show, guys. It's for the show. It was just for the show. We promise. <laughs> it's, it's the perfect cover. They never suspect a thing. Yeah, that's... um. That's something you're going to want to clear, I guess, off the off the history. Um, I was trying to think of some kind of clever bank robbery name, but mm. all I could come up with was Bank Robin Sean. So, I mean, that's not how's wrong. it going tonight, it's Bank Robin Sean? No, I think if you're doing a bank robbery, you need like an organized family name because, as I'm sure we'll learn tonight, most major bank robberies committed by some kind of organized crime. So you need kind of like you know, Papa Mariani, you know, or something. Yeah, kind of. If you if you're going the, for the for the ethnic the ethnic uh, angle, sure. That was ethnic. I think that sounded pretty ethnic. Did it? Are you sure? I think the the, the it was the it was all in the tone. It was mm. the, it was the tonality. In my in my chef boyardee voice. Yes, my... like the like the pizza guy on the it's a spicy uh, the, the chef ball. on the pizza box, basically. Yeah, I could hear him saying that. Um, but yeah, bank robin Sean. I, I that just to me that sounds like if we were in a debate. Like an actual debate, like if we, one of us was running for president, sure. or both of us were, that would be a nickname I would give you, Bank Robin Sean. That Bank Robin Sean over here, all he wants to do is rob banks, and I'm saying, I'm trying to give the wealth back to the people. I don't, I, I, I wouldn't even know how to respond. You, you'd, have, you'd have really <laughs> got me. I'd be so Sean. confused. I would just stand there <laughs> silently. Then I would just start. I would start chanting that at rallies. Bank Rob and Sean. Bank Rob and Sean. Lock him up. Lock, Lock him, him up. up. Yeah, Matt. Great idea. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Solid. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was thinking the other day. You know, famously, famously, uh, you and I did. Uh, and I'm sure you don't. This was one, I think like episodes in our first ten episodes we ever did. Our 2016 election preview. Do you remember that? Um, yeah, uh, sort of Very vaguely, bad. you could refresh, you could go ahead and refresh my memory there. That, well, that we, seems, it seems like decades ago, honestly. Well, yeah, because it was, it was back in 2014, 2015, we Almost, looked at, yeah. at who the Republican and Democratic candidates for president would be in 2016, and we were so off the mark, it was, oh, yeah. we literally didn't say the word Trump once in, oh, no. in the entire thing, we were so embarrassingly bad. Now that I don't, I really don't think we could be faulted for that. No, we um, can be because we didn't. We should have been talking about things we didn't know what we were talking. We were like, I think we. Picked, well, that's the that's like our whole thing. You that's picked like Bobby Jindal, so that like, that all right that that was what I was gonna say is you can't <laughs> fault us for not picking Trump, but the Bobby Jindal that that <laughs> I don't know where the hell that came from. I think Sean. we picked like Joe Biden, and it was it was bad. We were. Well, you know what? In in the parallel universe, I think to some degree we were probably more than fifty percent accurate. With uh, our uh, uh, arguably, a better universe, but that's okay, Matt. <laughs> I, but I was thinking, I think I, I was considering maybe we should do a twenty twenty election preview and see how hilariously wrong we could get. Oh yeah, it, but well, I mean, I think the fans expect it. I think they would beg us, please don't, please stop. <laughs> we beg of you. It's not going to be. It won't be as in depth now, though, because there's going there's an incumbent. So or will there be? <laughs> you know, I mean, we're going to swing for the All right. fences. All right, I guess there's a lot. There's a lot we could talk about. I, so we have to basically we have to do an episode on this. Is, is what I'm hearing. Excellent. Tweet at us if you'd like to see it. us uh, mm -hmm. be very wrong. I think it's it's definitely what our. What our fans expect. Of course. Nothing less. Uh, Matt, I don't want to get us off topic here. We're talking bank robberies. We're talking heists. Um, you picked this topic, Matt. Why Why did you want to talk about bank heists? I'll be honest. Um, I was watching a couple of videos on YouTube. I think it might have been on one of my 
one of my magical snow day adventures. Mm -hmm. I just sit at home and watch some YouTube every now and then. And uh, one of the videos I watched that just came up in my news feed, in my like YouTube feed, was uh, the top. It was like the top ten greatest bank robberies. Um, so after watching the video, I was like, "Oh, this would be a great idea for a show." And that's when I I uh, messaged you on the Slack, and that's kind that's kind of really it. That's where the idea came from. Was watching watching the YouTube uh, video about bank robberies. Yeah, fair. that's it. I think it's a, <laughs> no, I think it's a very interesting topic. Now, have you ever considered robbing a bank? I thought you were going to ask me if I've ever robbed a bank before, and I was going to. I think we I was know about to say if you know if the FBI wasn't listening before, they're definitely now. But um, no, I have never considered robbing a bank. I have never considered robbing a bank. I have never considered robbing a bank or mm. committing any crimes of any kind. Yes, of course. Speak right into the microphone. Uh, I, my, we also would have accepted. Uh, I did. I did uh, rob a crime, but only to fund my surfing passion when I was stopped by Gary Busey and Keanu Reeves. Uh, what? Point Break. Is that some kind of reference? Point oh, I've, ne I've never seen. Oh my Point god, that's a that's a rare movie I've seen. You haven't. That's a great movie. That's a. That's okay. A, I am an FBI agent. That's. Keanu Reeves shouts Is that your that. Keanu Reeves? Okay. Yes, but he does it in that kind of can. Oh, I am an FBI. I can't do Keanu Reeves. But anyway, it's very funny. It's a very – Gary Busey's crazy. I'll take your word for it. It's I've a, heard good it's, things. It's a great movie. I've heard good things about it. High sure. action. Patrick okay. Swayze. Yeah. Who can resist resist a Patrick Swayze He movie? surfs in the movie. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> um, it's a great one. Uh, so, Matt, what would you like to talk – Would you do you want to talk about specific – Bank robberies? Do you want to talk about the concept of robbing a bank? We could talk about both, I think. Okay. Um, I, I have the the one that started it all. I guess I'll, we'll, we'll start there. Um, it's called the 300 million yen robbery. Mm, okay. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the robbery that was kind of the basis or one of the bases of this, of this video that I watched on YouTube. If anybody wants to check it out, by the way, I'm pretty sure if you just YouTube 300 million yen robbery – you, you can probably um, – it will probably come up in one in a video or another. Um, essentially what this 300 million yen robbery – what happened was uh, it's December 10th, 1968. Okay? Um, it's morning at the um, Nihon Shintaku Ginko Bank in uh in tokyo tokyo japan and basically um the uh a, a police officer comes by on a motorcycle um young uniformed police officer um he he goes into the he goes into the bank and he informs the bank tellers that their branch manager's house has been blown up and they have received a warning that dynamite had been planted in um, a car that was transporting uh, almost 300, 300 million yen uh, from that bank to another branch, another company branch. Um, and the transport car hadn't left the bank yet, but, he, but they, this, this police officer was telling them that there's dynamite, that he needs to defuse it, um, and that their branch manager is dead, basically. So, like, sends them into shock immediately. Wow. Uh, the four employees leave the car. They're in the, this car, the transport car. That's where the, the police officer pulls them up and uh, pulls them over and, and tells them to get out, gets them out of the car. Um, they realize that the car, there's smoke coming from underneath the car and some flames. So, um, and the, the police officer begins to um, like yell, it's about to explode, run, run, run. So they get out of the range of the explosion. They hide behind a nearby wall. They crawl behind this like nearby wall and they, they kind of sit there and they wait, they wait for the explosion to happen and, and nothing. And, and they wait some more and then nothing happens. And, uh, one of them realizes that the, um, smell of smoke i guess has kind of dissipated so they think it's safe they can look over the wall over the the 
yay high wall, and the car's gone. The car carrying the 300,000 yen is gone um, inexplicably, and the bank employees are left behind this wall uh, clueless as to, as to what's just happened. But I think they probably had, a, had an idea. Uh, it turned out that the imposter police officer was, in fact, a bank robber. Mm-hmm. Usually and, is. Um, he, the the uh, smoke and flames uh, turned out to be the result of a warning flare that he had ignited underneath the car um, and that uh, the car basically was just driven into the sunset without a trace. A uh, massive police investigation was launched to recover the 300 million dollar 300 million yen that went missing. Um, they accused a 19 year old man, mm-hmm. son of a police officer, uh, who um, committed suicide. Had no alibi. However, they could not find the money at the time of his death. Um, and. Basically, you fast forward a little bit to 1975 when they think they've got the, – the total investigation lasted about seven years. And they think they found a, another suspect involved in this robbery who was a friend of this original, this 19-year-old man who, who was arrested in 68. Um, but the statute of, lim- statute of limitations was just on the brink of expiring. He had a large amount of money and did not have a, 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 a suitable alibi for how he acquired that money. But they basically were not able to prove that this money came from the robbery, so they had to let him go. And that's and that's really it. Uh, as of now, no, um, no further investigations are going on. The statute of limitations has expired, and this became the largest bank robbery in Japanese history. Wow. Wow. So. <laughs> a heck of a crime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so w- if we look at this bank robbery, um, I-, I guess what uh, what sticks out in my mind, right, is <laughs> I-, I guess the-, the-, the world was a different place in 1968, right? True. I mean um, – Something like really something like this today, you wouldn't think would ever be able to happen, or or could ever happen, or could it? Could it happen today? What do you think? Yes, and and I, similar things. Well, not well. I certainly stealing a vehicle filled with money is something that has happened recently. And and in my research for this episode, I came across the Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam back in late 90s, early 2000s, um, someone overpowered the, a driver of an armored truck at the airport and drove off with millions of dollars and diamonds and other things inside the uh, the armed truck. Finally uh, arrested him uh, back in, uh, in 2017. So uh, I certainly do think it could happen today, absolutely. All it takes is one person. Uh, it, it's, it's smart in some respects because robbing a bank, it's a big building, it's filled with a lot of people, there's all kinds of security, but a moving vehicle, a lot easier to um, to get your hands on, for sure. Mm. Yeah, um, I guess back in the days of of more tangible currency, we're definitely sure moving away from those days. That um, do you think that do you think that that makes bank robbing easier or more difficult? Like this new, I'll rephrase it: this the new digital currency age that we live in. Do you think that makes it more easier or more difficult for so, so called bank robbers? I don't, think it, do I don't think it makes a difference, to be honest, because I think while it creates a new breed of criminal, I think you're, the guys who were robbing banks a couple decades ago are still robbing banks now because they're not smart enough to know how hacking works. So, I, and I think there is still a lot of paper currency, still a lot of physical gold, diamonds, those sorts of things out there. And I don't really, I wouldn't think that there's a big difference. I'm sure... More money is stolen digitally now. I certainly think that's changed over time. But I still think that the same, you know, goons who used to knock up a jewelry store and and steal the diamonds, they're still going to be doing that regardless. Yeah. Um, 
One thing I really I really liked about this robbery, I guess something I appreciated about it is that no one was hurt. Sure. All right, it was it was a very clean. I like that very clean cut robberies. I don't like to hear stories of people getting hurt or killed in the middle of a bank robbery. I think it's very silly and unfortunate. So oh. Yeah. And in a lot of the successful ones that I read through research, usually the only people who got hurt were the robbers themselves who usually turned on each other or, you know, uh, later died uh, as a result of the police or of, of what other whatever other situation. But a lot of them are rather sort of simple crimes, not not sort of big, you know, not your Ocean's Eleven style uh, elaborate heists. They're usually much simpler than that. Sure. I think one of the most complicated ones I came across was the uh, Banco Central burglary. I don't know if you saw this one in uh, Brazil. It's one of the largest heists in history. About, uh, um, you know, if you convert the currency, about $71 million stolen in 2005. A gang of burglars, three months before the robbery, rented a property in the center of the city and tunneled 256 feet beneath two city blocks they literally dug a tunnel pretending they were a landscaping company so they could be shipping out dirt all the time that they were digging this huge tunnel under a bank. It sounds like a cartoon. <laughs> um, it's about two feet square, running about 13 feet beneath the surface. It was well constructed, had its own lighting and air circulation systems, took them three months. And on the final weekend before the hikes, they break th they broke through about three and a half feet of steel reinforced concrete to enter the vault from underneath. Um and like I said, they got away with about $71 million um, of notes um, weighing about three and a half tons. The bank was not insured, hilariously enough, uh, which is a very bad ideal. Um, and they were actually charged with a crime for mishandling the money. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, only $20 million of that has been recovered. And, uh, and let's see, eight of the men involved have been arrested, although they believe up to 25 may have been involved, but then the crime ended up involving kidnappers and a ransom and, and all kind of gangs and all sorts of stuff that, that went along with it. But, um, to me, I mean, this is, this is, I think at the outer end of involved robberies. I mean, digging a tunnel for three months is certainly much more complicated than just hijacking a vehicle or, some of these simpler crimes we'll probably talk about. I mean, this one really is a heavily planned, um, a heavily planned uh, heist. Yeah. Yeah. There, um, that's one with a lot of moving pieces. Big that, crew, that, big crew and a, and a big crew, kind of like an oceans 11 or really this is like an ocean. This is probably like a, like a, almost like, like a corporation size <laughs> team of bank robbers. Um, which kind of reminds me of, of the, um, the next bank robbery that I wanted to talk about. Um, so our, our first bank, the 300 yen, 300 million yen robbery, uh, was from 1968 involving the, uh, involving the hijacking of a truck set to, um, transfer funds from one branch to another all material currency, all hard currency. This one is very different. This is a cyber heist, mm. um, and you may have heard of this one. This is one of the one of the most famous, if not the most famous, uh, cyber heist. Uh, it took place in February of 2016. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the Bangladesh cyber heist or Bangladesh Bank cyber heist. Have you heard of this one? No, no, no. This is all new to me. Okay, um, this is one that I imagine they probably talk a lot about in classrooms of um, you know cybersecurity classrooms and and uh, college campuses uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. This just seems like one of those like textbook like how this we, how they did this and how you know this can't happen again and and how way different techniques to stop this, but. Uh, it's very interesting for the very reason that you brought up, like similar to the um, to the Brazilian heist that you were talking about, with with all these moving pieces and these these elaborate plans. This one, I'm I, I would be surprised if they've never made a movie about. It. If they haven't, they Hollywood should probably look into this. This is pretty wild. So, um, essentially, what happened was, um, there was a withdrawal. 
from an account at a Bangladesh bank. There are the National Bank of Bangladesh, but close to $1 billion U.S. Mm -hmm. um, the money was being held at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So uh, this request came in for a billion dollars withdrawal. Um, and uh, so they, they, they gave it the okay. And the one billion dollars uh, essentially were, were, were allowed to be transferred from um, from that bank in New York to I, I want to say China. I'm, I'm looking to make sure I can confirm this. Uh, let me see. Okay, all right. So. They actually they broke it up, Sean, into different banks. One one was a bank in oh. Sri Lanka, one was a bank in um, Bangladesh, and another was a bank in China. Basically, this one billion just kind of went to these three locations. They didn't really think anything of it, um, but. Let me see. The account that it was withdrawn from was the Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation. Or no, that was where the money was, was transferred to. Mm -hmm. um, into Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. Um, into the account of a Chinese Filipino businessman. They thought, like, nothing of it at first, but um, the... Uh, let me see. The... the they flagged it for review, but but these reviews went went overlooked, and essentially, um, it came out that this was this was a the work of hackers. Essentially, like cyber hackers had had hacked had made this transfer take place, and the clue, Sean, the big clue here, was the misspelling of one word in their request to transfer the funds. Um, when they when they made the request to withdraw this one billion dollars from this bank, uh, saying that they were from the Shalika Foundation, a Sri Lankan based private company, mm -hmm. they misspelled the word foundation. So they're they're the Shalika Foundation, but in the request to transfer the funds, they spelled it as foundation. Mm. So the Deutsche Bank flagged this as suspicious. Went back to the New York bank and said, "I guess, hey, this this um, spelling error makes this suspicious because you would think that a company would know how to spell a word that's in their name, uh, no matter where they're from." So um, they put a halt to the transaction, but it was kind of too late at that point. Um, and the uh, the money back to the Filipino Chinese businessman, the money that was deposited into his account was um, converted into poker chips mm. at a casino. Hard to trace. Hard to trace, exactly. Hard to trace poker chips. It was also at the time of the Chinese New Year. During the Chinese New Year, Bangladesh Bank informed RCBC, uh, Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation to stop the payment, refund the funds, and freeze and put the funds on hold uh, if the funds had already been transferred. But the Chinese New Year is a non-working holiday in the Philippines. So therefore, their message was uh, was received a day too late. Mm. By then, the funds had already been um, processed by RCBC's Jupiter Street branch. Um, and at that point, they had they had been issued to this man's account and they had been converted into the poker chips, I guess, that they had, uh, that they were difficult to trace. Uh, it took, it took them several years, and they were able to recover part of the money. Mm -hmm. Um, but pretty much the ramifications seemed to be more about. Uh, the banks themselves being being punished essentially in the aftermath. Oh, this is the fun. Okay, um, the banks were were severely, definitely severely punished, and things were looked into so that 
systems could be in place that this would never happen again. But the FBI actually uh, flagged North Korea. North, it was the, the hackers were from North Korea. Sure. Um, and the government of North Korea as partially responsible for, if not wholly responsible for, uh, for this hacking into the Bangladesh bank. Um, this, they cite similar similarities between the methods used in the Bangladesh heist and those in other cases, such as the hack of Sony Pictures Entertainment in 2014, the famous uh, Sony hacking, mm -hmm. where U.S. officials also attributed to North Korean hackers. Um, there's a group called the Lazarus Group, um, who have been behind numerous uh, numerous hackings in the past, from North Korea to uh, to this case. So, uh, but although nothing could be proven, um, some or all of the stolen funds may have eventually found its way to North Korea, um, and the investigation is still ongoing. So, yeah, there's, there's, this one is, is kind of hard to understand at first glance. It, it takes a lot of parsing through and breaking down, which is why I think it would make a very good movie. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, we're the ones that just made, uh, Vice. Uh, Adam McKay? Yeah. Did he also, and he also made the big, big short, short, right? Yeah. Yes. I think this is very much in his wheelhouse. I could see him making a making a good movie about this happening. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> they could even have like a little cameo appearance. Mike Myers could play Kim Jong Un. I think this would be the role he was born to play. <laughs> I think this would be a good one. Yeah, no, that's uh, you know, these uh, uh cyber crimes are um Certainly, uh, you know, are they more prevalent? I don't know, but they certainly seem easier if you know what you're doing uh, to to get away with these. Um, yeah, Th this this requires very different skills. It's more of a uh, it, it's obviously not really brick and mortar, uh, but this it just seems like this can only be the work of a large team. Sure, right? You know, is, you don't really think of this as like a single person job or single little it's not an oceans 11 job i would say this is more like an oceans 1100 job like you gotta have like a whole big team in on this i guess um this seems like there would be some kind of inside man like inside group that would be maybe um Maybe behind the scenes here. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just embellishing well, for, a the, lot of, for the movie's sake. But a, a lot of robberies have inside guys. I mean, you know, there's the famous Dunbar armored robbery, the largest cash robbery to have occurred in the U.S. back in 1997. $18.9 million uh, robbed in Los Angeles, masterminded by Alan Pace, who worked for Dunbar. If you've never seen, you know, you know they're a big national armored car company. Uh, he was a regional inspector, and so he had access to examine and photograph the armored car depot. He recruited five of his friends, and in 97, September of 97, used his keys to get into the facility. He timed the security cameras and determined how they could be avoided. Um, once inside, they waited in the staff cap cafeteria and ambushed the guards one by one as they took their lunch breaks. Um, he knew that on Friday nights, the vault was left open due to the large amount of quantity uh, of money being moved uh, and rushing the vault guards. The robber managed to subdue them before setting off any alarms. And in half an hour, they had loaded millions of dollars into a waiting U-Haul. Um, Pace even knew which bags contained the highest denomination and non-sequential bills. That's what you get when you have an inside man. Um, uh, police immediately realized it was an inside job, examined him, couldn't find anything, uh, and the gang even worked hard to conceal their new wealth, uh, laundering it through property deals, phony businesses, but eventually one of the gang members uh, made a mistake when he gave a real estate broker friend a stack of cash bound together with the original currency straps, which are traceable, um, and after going to the police, uh, they uh, he was arrested, named his co-conspirators, Alan Pace was sentenced to 24 years in prison and remains incarcerated. Less than half of the money was ever recovered, some $13.9 million still unaccounted for today hmm. so it you know when 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 you when you have the inside scoop and, and you understand the mechanics of the of the setup and the locations and the routines um that's that's a big advantage to have rather than just sort of hitting up a random bank here or there yeah 
And, and that requires the the inside knowings and the goings on and being being part of the system, I guess. Have you ever seen the movie Inside Man? No. It actually was really good. Is that a good movie? Who's in it? It was a good movie. It's it's old and um probably I wouldn't say outdated, but um probably probably lesser known movie. The Denzel Washington film? I'm gonna try to see who was in that. I think Denzel Washington. From two thousand six? Yeah, that's it. Directed by Spike Lee. It was directed by Spike Lee, really? Yep. Didn't know that. That was a great movie. Um, yeah, Clive Owen. Yeah, this was a really good movie. Really? Yep. J- yeah, Jodie Foster was in it. Um, I did not. I didn't know this was Spike Lee. This was a good, a very good movie. Um, not that I'm surprised. Spike Lee makes very good movies. I'm just surprised that it was him. Eighty six percent on Rotten Tomatoes for whatever that's worth. Yeah, yeah. This one, it's has got one of those twists that you don't see coming. That uh. I enjoyed. I enjoyed it. Sweet. Well, you know, we've yeah. mentioned uh, Ocean's Eleven a number of times. Have, are you a fan of the Ocean's Eleven film? Um, I am. I am. I think that they're they're so unique in their in their uh, just everything that they do. Their their cinematography, getting all of those stars together. Um, I I enjoy the I enjoy the Ocean's Eleven movies. Yeah. I, I don't I think, think I've seen all of them, but I've only seen the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, I to me they're just the textbook definition of fun. I just think they're fun movies, which is great. I'm, are they perfect? No, are they? You know, but it's just kind of a fun, exciting watch. And and even though I know the twists and and I've seen it a hundred times, it's still an enjoyable, uh, enjoyable film to watch uh, over and over. Sure. sure, they are. It is. It is a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know how many they've made, but, uh, well, they did, uh, oceans, 11 oceans, 12 oceans, 13, and then they did the reboot oceans eight last year. Right. Yep. That they did. Do you have another robbery, Matt? Or, oh no, we lost Matt. Oh no. This is not good. It's, it's reconnecting. Hold hold on, folks. I want to try and get Matt back on the line here uh, while we uh, try to reconnect. While we're waiting for Matt, um, and I try to figure out what's going on, uh, I'll plug now rather than plug. Oh, he's calling me. Let's see if we can get him. I'm back. He's back. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea what happened. Skype just quit on me there. No, my internet's flying, so I don't know what happened. Yeah, um, no, the, the program Skype just just quit. It just, couldn't like, it couldn't handle the excitement. Just said I've had enough. I think it didn't want to be complicit in our in our bank They're robbery listening. discussions. That's that's what it's, they're trying to shut us down. They know we're wiretapped. Well played, Skype police. Well played. Um. So, Matt, do you have a, <laughs> another robbery or? Um, yeah, let me, let me pull one up. We could talk about the Ocean's Eleven robbery, but that wasn't really. Oh, we could. I mean, it's, it's, I guess we could. It's, it's, it's an aggressively complex plan. It, it is. Um, and you know, I, I'll be completely honest with you, Sean. I didn't really understand probably like 50, <laughs> 65% of that movie about what was happening for most of I'll, I'll, I'll go be even even more honest I'll say probably like 70%. But that's kind of the idea. Yeah, it's not meant for the common the common schlubs like me to to fully well, understand. You're supposed to be kind of in the dark for large chunks of the movie. Yeah, and then they explain it like later on, right? They come right. out and they're okay. You're like, "Oh, why did they do that?" And then later it's like, "Oh, that was all part of the plan." <laughs> you're like, "Uh, Okay, I mean the movie. The movie really had me. Uh, there are certain elements that I kind of buy, but then at the same time, it's like they steal an EMP bomb from the local university that's big enough to shut down power to the whole city. Like, mm, you're kind of stretching your plausibility a little bit there with some of these things. Mm. But there's a lot of good stuff, you know, like when the SWAT team comes in, but it's not really the SWAT team, and then they 
change the outfits and they walk out with the money in the SWAT team bags. You know, it's kind of stuff like that where I'm like, I could see that actually working in real life. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's the cool thing about the movie is that it does seem very it does seem very plausible in a, to a certain degree. Like it does seem like somehow, I mean, I, I don't know if the, if we could sit down with like an expert in bank robbing uh, knowledge, mm -hmm. but it does really, it really does seem like it could happen. Right. Yeah. Um, aspects of it, aspects of it. I, I don't, I wouldn't say it's like end to end plausible, but I do think there are certain elements that um, certainly could happen in could happen in real life. But again, it just goes back to, as we'll talk about in a lot of these heists, they're not, the ones that have succeeded in life usually aren't the most complicated. You know, you don't have to have the world's most complicated, elaborate, Mission Impossible style, you know, heists to steal from somebody. You really just have to kind of beat up a guard or like smash a case and grab and then just not be an idiot afterward and get caught. Right. And that's, I think something like Ocean's Eleven, it's kind of a smidge overkill. Um, of course their payouts very large as well, but I don't think you would need quite the elaborates to, to, to pull off something like that, but it makes for a good movie. I mean, Vegas, the glitz and the glamor of Vegas. I mean, Vegas really is such a great setting for that film. I think if they were robbing in, in another location, it wouldn't be as exciting. So that yeah. helps. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you, if you set it in like Canton, Ohio, I don't think it would be. Muskegon. <laughs> people might not enjoy that yeah sure um speaking of bank robbing in states sean would you like to take a guess which state do you think suffers through the most bank robberies per year that is an amazing statistic and i'm gonna be so glad i know the answer um okay. before i answer that i'm gonna hijack your question a little bit because i'm a nice oh. guy i learned okay. this today do you know which state in america has the highest number of Pedestrian auto fatalities per capita. So not total, Meaning, but per population. Okay. Because uh, I think like Texas, California are the biggest, but that's just because they're the biggest state. So by by population capita. Pedestrian auto fatalities. People hit and killed by cars. Uh, I'm going to... Okay. The answer may surprise you. <laughs> Uh, my first thought was New Jersey. Is that right? Is it no. New Jersey? No, it's not New okay. Jersey. I'm just thinking because it's a densely populated state. A sure. lot of people, a lot of motorists. I'm sure a lot of people die there. Uh, it's not New Jersey. Nope. Would you like a hint? Is it Massachusetts? No. It's not New Jersey, but it is new. Is it New York? No. Oh. Uh, that would have been too easy. Yes. It's not New Mexico. It's New Mexico. That's weird. Isn't that what? weird? Really? Isn't that crazy? That is very crazy. It's sure. Bizarre. Okay. It's bizarre. So most pedestrian auto fatalities. Auto fatalities, meaning cars capita. hitting people. Yes, and killing them per per, per adjusted for them. population. Yeah. So it's like. Well, I guess I could kind of see that because I, I'm gonna. I've never been to New Mexico, but I can make a guess that a lot of the areas are pretty remote. So. If you were to hit someone with your car and and say be a really shitty human being and, and drive away or even stay and try to help them, maybe it would take a long time before uh, before you know medical assistance got to them. Yeah, I could see that. I also think part of it and sort of the crux of the article where I saw that statistic was that uh, SUV sales being on the rise uh, is – directly correlated to the recent rise in pedestrian auto fatalities, which is if you're going to get hit by a car, you'd rather it be a sedan because if you get hit by an SUV, it's more likely to actually kill you. Um, and part of it is that New Mexico just has a higher percentage of SUVs as the, as a percentage of the uh, driving vehicles. That is an interesting statistic. Yes. They, that's like they, some real, they that's did a like big study in Canada stuff. and they drew a direct line between, uh, increase in SUVs and increase in, in pedestrian fatalities. Okay. And people also drive worse in SUVs, which is also part of the cause. It's not just that hitting one is more likely to kill you. It's that you're more likely just to be hit by a car period. If that car is an SUV, because people in them drive worse. Now, do you think that's because 
what would you attribute that to? Do you think it's because people feel feel safer in an SUV, so they tend to take more risks? Yeah, I mean, the the again, they it was a scientific study, and the sort of the outcome of the study was that yeah, you're right. A big part of it is that people. Um, do drive more reckless in an SUV. They're also harder vehicles to control naturally because of their size. So if a vehicle like that's out of control, um, the driver has less. Even a perfect driver in an SUV is more likely to be in an accident simply because of the size of the vehicle. Um, you're you're safer in the vehicle as a as like a driver or a passenger, but it's more dangerous as a pedestrian or another driver. Um, and so that's. That's, I think there's been an increase in auto accidents. In general, part of that is attributed to that. Um, it's just generally more dangerous to have them on the road. Huh. Um, I like that. I like, I like everything about that. Stati- I mean, it's a very grim statistic. But it's interesting. But, but it is very interesting for, for stats nerds. Well, but it, and it's one like of those that. things a few years ago when um, – auto fatalities went down that people were wondering why. And now they trace it back to, they think when everyone went to fuel efficient cars, when gas was back at $4 a gallon, uh, they think that was part of it. So it's these interesting things you don't realize um, could be related when you see two, two statistics. So it's just interesting in that, in that respect. Um, No, to get back to your original question, um, which state has the most bank robberies, Oklahoma. Uh, Why do you think Oklahoma? Because I feel like, you know how whenever you see a weird story, you're like, oh, that took place in Florida, right? <laughs> yeah. I feel like time. every time I read about a bank robbery, it took place in Oklahoma. It's it's There's some kind of bias, like exposure bias, and that I only read stories about robberies in Oklahoma. But I do feel like, oh, there was a, a, a bank robbery took place in Oklahoma. So that's my guess. I don't think it's right, but that's the first thing I thought of. Um, It'd be crazy if that were true. It. It is not true. Okay. No, I didn't it is think not. So. Uh, the correct answer, Sean. California? In according, it is California. Yeah, that makes according sense. According to, yeah. According to the FBI, as reported by the CS Monitor, um, California recorded the largest number of bank robberies. This is uh, since 2011, though, mm-hmm. so the numbers may have changed. But um, in the past decade, um, followed by Texas, Ohio, yeah. And then your classic Florida. Yeah, where people live. I, you know, again, I'm sure if that were adjusted by population, it might be different. I'm sure the city of Los Angeles has more bank robberies than the entire state of Oklahoma. That wouldn't surprise me. Would you like to guess the state with the least number of bank robberies? Uh, that's a re- well, and I'm gonna say like Rhode Island or something. No, not Rhode Island. Or no, I'm sorry. It's gonna be like North Dakota or Wyoming. It's, it was North Dakota. Yeah, where nobody lives. That, okay, that's that, a pretty easy. That's a weird, uh, you gotta adjust that stat. <laughs> North Dakota got away with only two bank robberies. It's the in perfect the, in crime. The it's decade. they don't know how to investigate it there. Go rob a bank in North Dakota. They won't know what happened. Right. Nor- and then Vermont was second with only four. They don't have banks um, there. I've been to tie- Vermont. Tied with uh yeah, tied with with Wyoming. They pay for things in cheese and milk. They don't uh, they don't have banks. <laughs> this is probably true. Uh that's probably true. Um yeah. So there's the, the the state bank robbing statistics, um, and since we're on a statistics kick, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this one out. Bring it at up. You next, I like this one here. Um, Sean, can you do you think you could guess the day of the week? <laughs> the day of the week when most bank robberies are or when bank robberies are most likely to occur. Mm, that's a really good. My question though. Is is it a coincidence that most happen on a day, or is the is the you don't have to tell me what it is, but is there a stated reason why it happens on a day in this article, um, or they're just stating it as a fun fact? No, there there's a there is a reason. Okay, okay, because because my only thought would be, what day of the week would there be the most money in the bank? Like, what day are deposits usually done? I would think. It wouldn't be at the beginning of the week, right? That wouldn't make sense. So it would have to be like Friday. I think Friday. Friday's my guess. Maybe Sean Saturday. Jennings, you you are a you are a regular Sherlock Holmes. You got it right on the money. Mid morning on Fridays. Yeah, that would make sense because that's when businesses deposit the money. Yes, mid morning on Fridays uh, is when um, that is when bank robberies most are most likely to take place in the United States. I get that. Um, 
mid morning on Fridays, and for the exact reason that you gave that that's when large transfers are most likely to have been cleared. Yeah, most robberies took place. This is all according to an FBI study that's been released. Uh, most robberies took place at bank counters and involved notes demanding money and threats of weapons. Threats of weapons, not physical weapons. Most of the robberies took place on Fridays, regardless of the day. Most of them took place between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Wow, that's very specific. <laughs> yeah. But I see, like, I think robbing a bank is such a weak idea. Like, everyone robs a bank. Like, don't rob a bank. <laughs> and they've done that. That's why I love these guys who rob, like, It's airports. very cartoonish, isn't it? Like, cartoon villain almost. Well, but it's also like, you know, your local credit union's going to have a couple thousand bucks, maybe. I mean, it's not like they're rolling in money. Go rob an airport where they've got stashes of diamonds and stuff, or a jewelry store, or, I don't know, a museum. Something more interesting. I'm just saying your local your local bank, it's kind of like, oh, that's, that's small potatoes. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I also, I, I, what, what is the, well, there was a movie about that. Wasn't there about like, uh, like, let's not rob a bank. Let's rob these dang. It, it's gotta be, it's, it's the, it's absolutely the, oh, maybe, you know what? Maybe I'm thinking of Ocean's Eleven again. Oh, okay. The plot of, yeah, let's not rob a bank. Let's rob a casino. Casino's got more money than a bank. That that's probably what I was thinking of, but, um, oh, all right. The other the other one I was thinking of, not just Ocean's Eleven, but Pulp Fiction. Mm. They rob a diner in yes. the beginning of Pulp Fiction, and they're talking about how um, how the diners have just as much money, if not more. A lot of money moving around and, and low security, basically. Yes, yes. So that they want to go around and like hit up diners, pretty much. Yep. But yep. then uh, uh, Samuel L. Jackson thwarts their plans a little bit. That's what's but, great yeah. about uh, stealing something like gold bars, or uh, you know, you melt it down; it's untraceable. It's just a metal. You know. Yeah. There was a famous comedian. Um, I don't remember who he, who what his name was, but I remember um, and part of his stand up was that every guy wants to be part of a heist. That's something that every guy wants to, you know, it's like what he dreams of. It, would, would that be accurate to say, Sean? Was that uh, does every guy want to be part of a heist? All right, so are you asking me if if someone came up to me with the opportunity to be part of a bank heist, would I do it? Uh. Yes, that's exactly what I'm asking you right now. Um, for the record, I wouldn't. I'm saying yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you know. I think I would want to like. I think my response would be, I'll like watch from like I'll be. I want to be in the bank as like a hostage, like because I want to like I want to see it happen because this sounds exciting. But I do not want to participate. Um, not because of the threat of jail time, but it just sounds like a lot of work. Well, you got to case the joint, and then you got to, like, hang out, and you got to get along. And then, like, what happens when you get the money, and then people start turning on each other? You know, it's kind of like winning the lottery. Like, do you really want to win the lottery? It just sounds like a lot of hassle. Yeah. And that's what a bank robbery sounds like. It's a lot. Like, I think it would actually be easier to just have a regular job, you know, to a certain degree. It might be more tedious and monotonous and... And all that, but it like bl planning planning a bank robbery sounds like it's a job in itself. Well, and I think I would do it alone. I don't think I'd want a crew because I think then you're just complicating things. You're increasing your risk of getting caught. There's a great robbery. Um, it's a it's not a bank heist. It's an art heist, but I still think it applies. The Isabella Stewart Gartner Museum in Boston back in 1990. Uh, 13 works of art were stolen right off the wall for a total of about $500 million. Um, guards admitted two men posing as police officers responding to a disturbance call. Once inside, they tied up the guards and then over the hour committed the largest value recorded theft of private property in history. To this day, no arrests have been made and no works have ever been recovered. Um, the perfect crime. And Matt, that sounds more like a good idea than some of these. I don't need to dig a giant tunnel with 25 people over three months to get into a bank vault when you just need a buddy, you overpower a couple weak guards at a 
art museum nobody thinks is going to get robbed and you just take off with the art and you're good yeah. to go. Now, of course, you got to fence it. the art. You got to get rid of it somehow. But even if you, you take sell it to, you just sell it to like a big Chinese billionaire. Well, so you, you take pennies on the dollar for it. Part. I mean, if it's worth 500 million, you take 5 million and you're still doing pretty well. Um, right. But that's what I'm saying. Think small. I don't I don't get the, the Ocean's Eleven style heist. It's like that's way too complicated, guys. You're overthinking it. Yeah, definitely. Um, what what was the famous movie that did an art heist where they sold some art? Was that Mission Impossible? Did they steal art in that movie? Uh, not that I know of. They stole... Oh, The Da Vinci Code. That's oh, what... yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Classic. Yes. Robert Langdon, Thomas Hanks. <laughs> Thomas Hanks. Yeah, no one calls him that, do they? Uh, no, not usually. But he has a brother. Did you know that? Yes, Colin Hanks. He's great. He, uh, they, he's, he's recently been doing the, I guess there's some kind of contract with Disney yeah, and Pixar, so he can't do any voice work for Woody from Toy Story outside of the movies. So it, famously his brother stepped into the role yeah. and is the voice, provided the voice for, of Woody for Kingdom Hearts 3. Yeah, he's done it for a bunch of other, um, a bunch of other stuff. Um, it's pretty cool. He sounds a lot like him. But he doesn't really look like him, which I think is weird. Uh, what's his name? I've never actually Colin seen... Hanks. You'd know his face. Oh. He's uh, he was in uh, Dexter and Fargo and The Good Guys and Life in Pieces. Um, oh, he's his son. I'm sorry, it's his son. It's oh, this guy. Oh, yeah. Are we talking about the same guy? Son. No, I'm just, uh, his brother. Tom oh, Hanks. I thought you were talking about Colin Hanks. Who are you talking about? Tom Hanks' brother. I didn't know he had a he had a Jim Hanks. Yes, Jim Hanks. Oh. He he looks a lot like him. Yeah, he 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 has that he has the same face. Oh, yeah, okay, I see it. Jim Hanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh what movies was Jim Hanks? He was in uh He wasn't really in Baby anything. Baby Geniuses Major, as a goon. Like. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, not really much, but he's directed stuff. He, yeah, and he also he does he does the voice work for his brother who who can't do uh can't do it because of his uh, contract, I guess. Yeah, he's done Woody in a lot of things. Hmm. Yeah, go figure. Tom, Tom Hanks has a, has another brother named Larry, and also a sister named Sandra. Oh, he's a nice man. Married to Rita Wilson. Yeah. Actor. What do you think is his worst movie? Tom Hanks' worst movie? Yeah. Is that possible? Yeah, well, have... nobody, not every movie he made was great. Oh, I can't. Uh, Larry can't... Crown? What's, what, I... Well, there you go. <laughs> Maybe The Terminal? I didn't see The Terminal, Ooh, but. I oh, talk it's got to be. For a long time about The Terminal. It's got to be Inferno. Yeah, probably. Inferno but, sucked. But he's just doing those for the paycheck, man. That's I mean, leave pay... him yeah, alone. That's... That's a paycheck movie for sure. Cut him, cut him some slack, I would say. Uh, if we're but if we're talking about a movie that he really cared about, that like he was very intentional about being in, that he did it for the art. Yeah, maybe Larry Crown. <laughs> or the Burbs. You know, it's kind of crazy when you think about he had like ten major hits back to back for a while there a league of their own sleepless in seattle philadelphia forrest gump apollo 13 toy story saving private ryan you've got mail toy story 2 the green mile cast away catch me if you can and then it kind of tails off the terminal polar express da vinci code hmm. charlie wilson's war um but yeah man what a what a talented guy money pit great movie yeah. Splash, great movie. Oh, yeah. Splash. Um Captain Phillips, I, great movie. I thought he was really good in in uh was that a League of Their Own? A League of Their Own. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The best. That was that was excellent. And the terminal he's not the problem with that movie. That movie has a lot of problems. He's not the problem with that movie. 
Mm, I, you know, I never saw the terminal. Don't. It's... Talk to me about the terminal. Oh, boy. He does this really aggressive Eastern European accent. Oh, my name is Victor Navorsky. I mean, it's it's so... <laughs> and he's giving it his all. And I can't fault him because he is, he is giving it everything he's got. But the script is bad. It's not great. Um, and... Stanley Tucci's really weird in it, and it's just it's just the most like meh movie ever. It's very weird. The film is about an Eastern European man who Based becomes stuck story. in New York's John F. Kennedy Airport terminal when he is denied entry into the United States and at the same time cannot return to his native country because of a military coup. The film is partially inspired by the 18-year stay of Mehran. Karimi Nasseri in Terminal 1 of Paris's Charles de Gaulle Airport uh, from 1988 to 2006. Yeah. He was there for 18 years. He lived in, in the airport. Loosely based on a true story. That is crazy. Yep. Um, oh, Spielberg decided to direct the Terminal because he had just come off finishing his previous film, Catch Me If You Can. Uh, and wanted to make another film that could make us laugh and cry and feel good about the world. Due to a lack of suitable airports willing to provide their facilities for production, an entire working set was built inside a large hangar at the L.A. Palmdale, Re Palmdale Regional Airport. Absolutely. They built well, an entire airport terminal for the movie. And, and the external shots were shot in Montreal's Mirabelle International Airport. Yep. That is... Uh, one of his weakest movies, That's I would interesting. argue. Interesting. Um, Spielberg. One of Spielberg's weakest. Movies. Yeah, I can't see this being very good. I, I just can't see it going many places. Like if the entire play, the entire thing takes place inside of the airport. What can it possibly be about? Just him hanging out in this airport? No, it's no, there? it's weird because Stanley Tucci plays like this, this the head of security at the airport who won't let him leave, and then he kind of like he hates him hates Tom Hanks' character for, like, no good reason. <laughs> and so it's kind of like his enemy in the movie, but it doesn't really work. And then Catherine Zeta-Jones plays a stewardess who is supposed to fall in love with him, but, like, it doesn't make any sense that they fall in love. And then there's a bunch of, like, Zoe Saldana is a side character, Diego Luna is a side character, who have, like, their little adventures in the airport, but they're all kind of unappealing. And it's then they throw like a weird twist in in the last ten minutes of the movie that you're like, wait, you should have told us that at the beginning. It's just a, it's just, it's not bad. It's just like, it's like oatmeal. It's just kind of meh, you know? Yeah. It's it's a little it's a little too and it's a little bit slapsticky too, which is kind of annoying. Where there's a little bit of whoa, you know? It, it's just very weird. Tom Hanks' uh, character was described as a pastiche of. Uh, Eastern European and former Soviet bloc um, countries. He spoke, the, the character speaks the Bulgarian language, uh, and the in the beginning they show a picture of a map on an airport television screen, uh, and the map is actually of the borders of Macedonia. But it, the, the fake country is... Krakosia. And the Krakosia. whole and, and like for the first chunk of the movie he just points at things and goes Krakosia. Krakosia. <laughs> it's, it's very good. You at least see the trailer. The accent he does is just uh, I would just, love to. Is just, I, I remember when this was like coming out. For yeah, some they, reason. they sold it as like a romantic comedy and it's not. It's really not. It's it's odd. I mean, it's nicely shot. I'll give Spielberg credit. It, like it looks nice. But <laughs> There's a link from the Wikipedia article to list of people who have lived at airports. Oh. This is a list of people. A big list. Notable for living in airports for more than periods of more than a week. Uh, the lar the longest span was that, that man, Mehran Karimi Nasseri, who was exiled from Iran um, and later had his documents stolen in Paris en route to the United Kingdom. Therefore, he was re refused entry. Um and he lived at the airport from 1988 to 2006 at the Charles de Gaulle Airport in France. Um, second longest is Denise Louise de Souza, who is Brazilian, who has been, he is continuously, he's still living in the, in the Sao Paulo 
Goralios International Airport in Brazil. He's been living there since 2000, hmm. so about 19 years. Uh, after frequent conflicts at home, he decided to take refuge in his local airport. He seems to suffer from a psychological problems. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, what I like about this list is to yeah. qualify... You only have to live in an airport for more than a week. Matt, I think you should do it to get on this Wikipedia list. Just so I can list. get on this list. Like, Reason for stay. To be notable. To be on Wikipedia. Yeah, that's citable. I think that live, <laughs> live there for seven days, and it counts. Okay. And they, uh, to see well, if you can do they, it. Yeah, they have Heinz Mueller, who gets his, he gets his own section, and he was only in the airport for 13 days. That's nothing. That's weak. He, he flew to Rio de Janeiro to meet with a woman he met online, but she did not show up. He ran out of money and ended up in Campinas, which is a city in Brazil, and, and he lives in their airport. And he's, but he's only been there for 13. He was only there for 13 days. That's But he gets his own weak. article. That's he literally weak. gets his own article. I think you should and do he, it. He stopped there because they, somebody took him to the hospital. Somebody was there for 23 days. I could absolutely live in an airport for 13 days. There are so many uh, amenities. And Famous amen- last words. I could absolutely live in an airport for 13 days. <laughs> okay, Matt. Good luck. Uh, I wouldn't want to. I think if you paid me. If, if, if I was, like, given money for food... It would be. It would still be really uncomfortable. Like, There's probably no showers in there. What the a airport. shitty place to like. If you could choose a weird place to live, why would you choose the airport? Like break a record Question. and like live in a shopping mall for two weeks. I think that would be more fun. Well, I think in in most of the cases on this list, they're either political. Well, I know they're not refugees. choosing, but I'm saying you're choosing to live there. Oh, if I were to choose, no, you know, I would. If you're I gonna break some sort of, I'm gonna live somewhere record. Do it. Do it somewhere fun. Or more fun than an airport. Yeah. There there are definitely where would where would you live? Oh boy. If I had to live somewhere for two like a couple weeks to break a record. Um I like a, maybe a sports stadium might be fun. A sports stadium? A sports stadium, you know? The Alamo Dome. I don't know. Could be could be a hoot. I don't know, just somewhere in Disneyland. That could be fun. Not an airport. Where would you live, Matt? Supermarket, maybe? Um, Supermarket would be a... Well, no, I, I would say no. The supermarket, the problem with that is that there's tons of food there, but not necessarily... Like, where where would you cook the food? I mean, I guess you could eat, like, fruits and vegetables. Maybe, like, a Walmart be might, might be better, because then there's, like, you could take out a camping stove and... There's surprisingly not a lot of food that you could just eat right at the grocery store without without some kind of gear to cook it or prepare it properly. Sure. Um, but but that's a I mean that's a possibility. Where would you sleep though? I guess just on the floor somewhere. I I don't know. I, I would be kind of comfortable in a grocery store. There's something comforting about it. Yeah, you could you could sleep in with all the vegetables. Sure. Uh, maybe like a Dick Sporting Goods, like a mattress mattress oh, firm. Oh, there you go. That way you'd have a pl- IKEA. IKEA. No. Oh brand. yes, I would, I would you live in an it. IKEA. You Set. win. Yeah, you win. It's gotta, gotta be the. It's IKEA. got it all. I could live for a whole year. In they've got IKEA. every. They've got oh, everything you have in your house. There. It's so like you a just hotel. Go from section, and they have a restaurant. A hundred percent. They had a restaurant. Yeah, it's the IKEA. That's. I'll do that voluntarily. Sold. I wonder if there's a Wikipedia list for people who have lived in IKEA. <laughs> Matt, we got to get your viral stunt going where you're going to. I'd live like in to IKEA. be on that list. Yeah, I would do it. I wouldn't even need anybody to comp my food. I would. I would pay for the food myself. Living in an IKEA would be oh, great. Matt, where are you going on vacation? IKEA? Oh, just I'm, for the day? No. <laughs> no. No. I'm going to spend a week in the IKEA. Yep. Feel like do they uh, let you do that? You could, you could try a different bed every night. You could try a different. They got couches couch. and chairs and tables and. Oh yeah, IKEA would be wonderful. That that you so nailed it. I, that's the mm-hmm. best answer we've ever given on this show, right there. Oh yeah, well done, that's sir. No brainer. Well I, I wonder. We should we should probably tweet that out and see if we get see any if different agree. responses. I doubt that anyone will be able to find a better you know, place, a no, better place than IKEA. It's perfect. It's like the Disneyland of home decorating. It's wonderful. Yes, it is. It really is. We could do a whole episode on IKEA. I love IKEA. 
Have you ever been to a Bob's Discount Furniture? Uh, no, I have not been to a Bob's. That's a New England thing, right? Yeah, we've got a number of Bob's. I like Bob's. I've been there once or twice. Thing. They're they're okay. They're no IKEA by any stretch, but they 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 have like a little snack shop with cookies and popcorn, and they even the one I went to even had a movie theater. Mm. They're playing Finding Nemo. Wow. And it was like a legit movie theater. It was pretty cool. I went to a, uh, a furniture store in Houston called Gallery Furniture, which is the big mattress Mac, as he's known as the guy who owns it, uh, the biggest furniture store in Houston. And they had uh, they had monkeys in a big glass cage in the middle. Several like, monkeys. Like live monkeys? Yeah, like live monkeys. And they were just there. And you could just like stare at them. I don't like that. It, no, I would be it very was unsettled very by that. Yes, <laughs> it was. It was. It wasn't great. Also, what, what could it? What, what, what kind of horrible shit could happen if those monkeys ever got free? Could you oh my imagine? God, they'd go bonkers on all that furniture. <laughs> they'd be, they'd be bouncing on all those beds. It'd be great. Really, this guy has never seen uh, Jumanji. No. Oh my goodness. I mean, there weren't that many, but at the same time, you definitely, they did not look happy. No, I'm sure they weren't. I'm sure if they ever got the chance, they would (laughs) just run a a, literally ape shit all over the store. Yeah. That store was, that's where there would be literal ape shit all over the store. Mattress Mac, he's out of his mind. Mm -hmm. Clearly. It's a crazy man. Uh, Matt, we're over time, if you can believe it. We, we, we got off the rails there a little at the end, but, uh, but do you have any, any final thoughts on bank robberies? Are you going to oh, rob a bank that's now? right. That's what we were talking about, yeah. bank robberies. Um, I think that there should be, uh, there should be a movie made about at least one of these two that, that, that I talked about, the, the 300 million yen robbery and the 2016 cyber heist of uh the bangladesh cyber heist i think that was that's pretty cool um not that it was it wasn't cool that people lost their money and banks lost their money but it was cool that nobody got hurt and uh, that we know of um and it was cool that these things are are pretty crazy just to look at all the missing pieces or the, the moving pieces rather and and believe that that these things can get off without uh you know, and actually, they, they for the most part, it seems like they got away with it. Um, well, I mean, to also today. to be fair, though, you know, we, we probably Googled most famous bank robberies, and those are the ones that got away. I'm sure that there's exactly. hundreds of thousands of other bank robberies that weren't so lucky. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. But it's kind of like playing the lottery, right? You got to gamble sometimes. Give it a shot. Who knows? We're not recommending you go rob a bank. Let's be clear. We have mm. to have that disclaimer in there. Um, but uh, but yeah, very cool, very interesting stuff. I hope folks uh, enjoyed this little walk through uh, some interesting stuff about bank robberies. If you've ever robbed a bank, please let us know. You can reach out to us at Up for Debate TV on Twitter, or email us at TV at gmail.com. We want to hear all about your heist. Um, our website, Up for Debate TV. Go there, check it out. It's very exciting. Uh, we have all of our past episodes there, the audio, the video. You can, of course, subscribe to the show anywhere you get podcasts, Overcast, Stitcher, uh, now on Spotify, which is great, Pandora, anywhere you get podcasts, we're there, including the video on YouTube. Uh, and I will mention that we've got some excellent A-plus content coming up on the show in the next few weeks, including our summer movie league draft will be coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, we've got 30 new movies for the summer, big movies. Matt, we've got, what, three or four Marvel movies. We've got several big-name sequels. We've got a couple big animated films. It's going to be an exciting. Our teams are back, and we're going to have our big draft. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're not going to want to miss that. Also coming up after the movie draft will be our big, it's finally here. We've been getting psyched, doing our research, our big James Bond and film retrospective. We're going to watch all 24 James Bond films and we're going to talk about it. It's going to be very exciting. I'm very excited. Our next Big Up for Debate Presents is going to be a great series. Now is the time to subscribe to the show if you're not already because we've got some excellent stuff coming down the pipe map. Are you excited? Oh, uh, yeah. I am on the edge of my seat over here, Sean. You know, like we say here, Matt, you can pay for the whole seat, but you're only going to need the edge. <laughs> Don't you forget that. That's right. Uh, it's going to be great, but we got to wrap up this episode. So on behalf of Matt, I'm Sean. Thanks everybody for joining us. We appreciate it as always. And we'll see you next time for more great discussion on another Up for Debate.